I'm Rob LaCourie, a senior editor here at Gold Derby with visual effects supervisor Marlon Leo and visual effects producer TJ Falls, both nominated for Andor. First of all, guys, congratulations on your Emmy nomination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's big for everybody, so it's really nice to, to be a part of it. Oh, absolutely. You know, in this category, uh, this category, you get nominated for the whole season. That's how it works. And alongside some amazing shows like House of the Dragon, The Last of Us, The Rings of Power and your Star Wars brethren um, at The Mandalorian. Um, I'd really like to know, first of all, Moen, um, how you found out about the nomination and just, you know, your reaction to when you found out you are now Emmy nominee, uh, Moen Leo. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was obviously a surprise. I got a, um, got a text message basically, um, because we, we are still pretty busy. We're, um, we're so busy actually uh, shooting. And, uh, so I just in the morning got a text message and I was like, oh, wow, wow. Cause I hadn't even followed sort of the schedule of when nominations would be announced or anything. Wow. And what about you, TJ? Yeah. It was it's very similar to me because we, we were shooting, we were busy. It was it was work and 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 I had a bunch of text messages that popped up, but it was like, oh, congratulations. I had no idea that the nomination was being announced that day. And so I was like, I, what is this? And then I saw a couple of them and and uh, and then it, it was it was quite obvious what had happened. And uh, it was it was it was surprising. And yet, you know, I'm also really proud about it all as well. As you should be, you know, um, when you think about all the shows that weren't nominated, which I won't name some really heavy hitters. The fact that you're able to make it into this group just tells me that your fellow visual effects artists in the um, uh, Emmys branch really appreciated the different spin that you both and your teams put on the Star Wars universe for Andor. And we're going to go into a bit more detail in a sec, but I was um, actually thinking it'd be really great, um, perhaps maybe you first, Moen, to explain to our viewers what you both bring to the table as part of the VFX team at Andor. Yeah, so as visual effects supervisor, um, I basically oversee all of the you know uh, digital um, visual effects that go into the show creatively. Um, at the same time, working with with TJ as a producer, obviously, um, on this. And so we we get involved very early on, like at the point where they're still writing the show, and we start advising on you know what's what's achievable. And then we kind of are on set throughout the, the shoot of it as well, making sure that things are shot in a way that um, that works for us in post-production, uh, working with a previous like pre-visualization team of planning out complex sequences and how to shoot them. And then ultimately, once the shoot completes, we're um, for several months still in post-production, working with different vendors around the world, really, and hundreds of artists to, to complete the work. Yeah, it sounds... It sounds so daunting. Um, and TJ, what about you in your role as producer? Yeah, so I, I work through all the logistics, the budgeting, the planning, the scheduling. You know, Mo and I work hand in hand together. So we're we're together most of the time. And <laughs> as Moen said, from the very beginning and, and we work through to the very end. And, and part of what I do is help ensure that we get integration within the other departments because a lot of what made Andor so successful is how well everybody collaborated interdepartmentally and I mean it went it went from hair and makeup the costume to sound to editorial to all of those those facets so I help make sure that that each of the pieces that we need to do are actually happening while Moen's working through the creative uh, aspects of it all um, yeah. beyond that we also have our number of vendors that we work with and uh, and ensure that that all the pieces are happening as they should, and Moen's overseeing the, 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 the creative shot design aspect of it all. It's so common these days, actually, for um, various VFX houses around the world to chip in and ver on various parts of a film or a series, um, which gives, I mean, I just can't imagine how you're able to, to give the show a consistent look and feel when you have so many contributors, but I suppose that's the whole point of having you guys on the ground, making sure that everything you know, works out beautifully. Is that, would that be the, a pretty accurate description? I think it would be. That's exactly what Moen does, is ensure <laughs> the consistency, the level, while also ensuring that we're fulfilling Tony Gilroy's vision and, you know, and, for, and satisfying what the directors and the, the, the editors and, and all the creative team bring to the table. There needs to be that balance so that episode one looks the same as episode six, looks the same as episode 12. And, and Moen does a masterful job with that. 
Well, yeah. and I mean, also, you know, to take into account that, that um, you know, we have so much work on a show like this. You know, we, we had like 3,800 shots roughly or so across, you know, the 12 episodes. And so um, it's, it's not just me, you know, there's like, there's the individual visual effects supervisors at the different vendors. And then, you know, they're sort of departmental supervisors and all of the artists. And, and it's really a huge collaborative effort where, um, it's not like all of the creative ideas originated from me by any by any stretch. I'm just I also am just there to sort of guide you know people and and make sure that everyone contributes the best thing they can contribute to the show because you can only do something like this with really the combined talent of like hundreds of people. That's right. Yeah, it takes it really actually does take a village um to make a show like this work, and I'm sure all of the shows in your category are in the same boat. They're all, you know, and they're all really super impressive. You know, I was, um, what I loved, well, I like a lot of things about Andor. One of them was, and we use this word often when describing the show, how grounded it looks and feels. I love how it's more industrial and it's darker, dystopian, like brutalist, retro futuristic. So um, I'm just wondering, perhaps you first, TJ, and then we'll move to Moen, how much of that aesthetic uh, guide I guess the way in which the visual effects were going to be approached on the show yeah I mean that 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 was all by design it was it was from the very first conversations of what the look and the tone of the show was going to be and and you know I'll let Moen speak a little bit more to the, the creative conversations he had with Tony but that was all purposefully done and what we then did was ensure that we had realistic locations you know the the, the feel of it all we wanted it to to feel the audience to feel that they could have been walking in the streets. They could have been in this in in Coruscant. They could have done these things. It's not so fantastical that you couldn't imagine yourself in these locations, and and it was able it, and by able to be able to make that tone feel real. Not only did it help give us a basis of how we wanted all the visual effects to right. to grow and and look, but it also was able to to to, to provide that feeling that we wanted the audience to have. Yeah, and and I think that um, TJ is right. A, a big part of it was that that more so even than Rogue One, which we had also worked on with, with Tony Gilroy, both of us. Um, uh, more so than Rogue One, this is really a story about more or less ordinary people, right? It's it's yeah. not people with superpowers. It's not you know like a fa fantasy really, and so it's really important. It was really important to Tony from the start that uh, the the world we created around them. Um, was something that was relatable and felt, you know, tangible. So, because um, I don't, you know, the, it's interesting that that our show might be sort of one of the first shows in Star Wars that, you know, where you actually have like people go to work, live in an apartment yeah. building, you know, take public transport, like those, you know, and maybe that's been done before, but still, you know, and so, um, so what uh, early on was the conversations both with, with Tony, but also, Really importantly, where the production designer um, Luke Howell, who's been like was like a fantastic and is a fantastic partner in, in all this, is to figure out how do we make these things feel real. And as to, uh, as uh, TJ said, a big part of that was to anchor everything in reality. To um, even if we had to create a um, an environment that was you know could never exist on Earth, to find some part of it in the real world, whether it's like a backlot set or a, or a location in London or something like that, where we could shoot and find that groundedness, you know, that, that bit that then makes all of the visual effects around it feel real. Yeah, you know, I, when, when I think about the show and how it impacted me, it's, it's that groundedness that I think ups the ante for the for what the show's about, you know, um, these people who are uprising against fascism and um, and the struggles of the ordinary person and how they can make a difference. All that stuff is so relatable. This is a drama series set in space to me, and that's I think that just gives you guys so much opportunity to do something really different. And I think that's what sets and or apart from perhaps maybe the other shows in your category. So that leads me to this. Tony Gilroy is a huge part of why Rogue One, in my mind, is probably the best Star Wars, perhaps maybe apart from the very first original one. Um, Andor comes along and we're all, you know, we're all just in love with the show, but it's a lot of it is because of him. So what does he bring to the table, TJ, um, as a filmmaker that you most value and admire? Oh, uh, he... 
he's he's fantastic to work with and and mo and i both work on rogue one and have a long history with him so we've already got a shorthand but he's very down to earth and he's very specific in what he wants he's all about story he's all about intention and that really helps us then service that vision because we can take that idea visually and bring it into the story so having a partner like that really opens up the world to us to be able to make what it is that 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 we need while still having that guiding hand along the way uh, you know, star wars is a huge universe and being able to have you know to tell different stories within the universe is one of the things that's that's most exciting to me and so when when tony brings an idea of well you know the story is about this journey of andor of cassian it, the the journey is about the the impetus of the, of the rebellion and how these things have happened he's less worried about the star wars aspect and more in, in, worried about well, how does this tell a good story? How does this provide a message and, and an ideal throughout the course of the series? And then relies on his various departments, us included, to be able to bring the Star Wars to it and make it a, a whole, an entity of, 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 of that universe. And that, I think, is, is really inspiring and, uh, uh, and helpful through the process. And, and I think one of the things also, because we had both worked on, on Star Wars projects before that, um, you know, Often in, in Star Wars, there, there is almost habitually sort of a, a, a tendency there to just go, oh, and let's connect this to that and let's put all of these Easter eggs in and let's, you know, like sort of stuff everything we can in, uh, into every, every part of it. And I think what Tony said from the beginning is sort of like this idea that, no, let's, let's not be distracted. Let's not put unnecessary distractions into it. Um, if if there are things that are quintessentially Star Wars that we can bring in that that further the story, that further the characters, that's great. But at the same time, if there's something that we're just throwing in for the for the sake of it, let let's not, you know. And and I think that's um, that was that was really great because it it then almost fostered sort of a culture where um, we could really openly sort of negotiate if there were were things that like for example for us were like really difficult in visual sex and we'd go like you know how important is this part to you and he was tremendously and is tremendously um a collaborative there to say like yeah we uh, okay well that part is not important this is the part that's important to me so that's where we should put the effort wow you know there's so much that we can talk about in terms of specific details like for example i love a luthan ship Fondor, um and i read somewhere that you were um, inspired by, uh, you know, um, James Bond type vehicle um, aesthetic, which I think is kind of cool and didn't really occur to me until I read that and looked back on it and thought, wow, that is so different. Um, does that often happen when you're trying to work out how to visualise Tony's vision that you'll come up with inspirations that are probably not very expected? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that one, you know, was certainly out of conversations with also with Luke Hull, you know, the, the production designer who ultimately designed the ship. And then we kind of worked with Luke in previous sort of ideas of how to make it then actually have weapons and what the weapons are and, and all that. But um I think we generally try to get get inspiration from every <laughs> everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's it is particularly fun if you can take things. From a completely different context and go like, well, what would this be like in Star Wars? You know, like if how would like an idea like this work in Star Wars? And so um, I think that's something we we um, consistently do, and um, it it makes it it makes it really fun for me, like my work really fun because I quite often have the sort of almost luxury to go, let me just go on mm -hmm. YouTube. And just look at like a hundred random things, and then there's suddenly one where it's like, "Wow, this is really cool!" Like, there's a way we can fit this into our story, you know? So, wow, that is so cool. Another one that occurs to me is um, just that it, that holographic image of Marla, Marva um towering over the mourners at her funeral on Rick's Road. I um, for some reason, cannot get that scene out of my head. A lot of it has to do, of course, with the performance. Of Fiona Shaw, but is is that a shot like that? Is is it a simple thing to create, or is it actually more complicated than we than we think? 
I think the main thing on that sequence was really uh, planning ahead. And I think that's also to a large extent why we were able to do quite a lot of um, like more ambitious stuff on our show in general is that that Tony, as TJ said, is very clear about what he wants and then sticks with it. And so we could, for example, with that scene go, okay, well, we need to know what all of the different angles, camera angles are going to be that we're gonna see this hologram for, uh, from before we shoot it so that we can plan out where are all the cameras gonna be? Because ultimately then you have to shoot elements of the actress, because it was important for Tony and for us as well, that this is not like a CG version of Marva, it's actually mm -hmm. the, the actress. So you have to shoot um, footage of her from, uh, from matching angles. And then there's a bit of math involved because she's actually much bigger than everyone else. So all of the cameras have to be you know, translated differently. Um, and then, so we work with, with um, Jennifer Kitching, our um, previous supervisor from third floor, block out the entire scene with the directors, say like, this is where all the camera's gonna be. And then it becomes quote unquote easy because as long as everyone sticks to the plan, then you can just go, okay, let's get through it. Let's shoot all of the elements that we need and then put them together. Wow. It's really fun it, because it does make a number of things in our show that could have been quite complicated, relatively straightforward because of pre-planning, because of proper use of pre-vis, tech-vis, and the the commitment of the directors to work within the framework that Tony provided, so mm -hmm. it, it 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 makes our job easier, but it also makes our job able to be more open and flexible, and and provide the ability to to give more with less, so that we're able to to to, to make the show, you know, have these moments that that can be quite special. Yes, yeah. because for us, what's what's really important is ideally to not say know when somebody comes up with with an ambitious idea and sometimes these ideas are too ambitious for for what we can do within the you know schedule or the budget of, of a streaming show but but rather than saying no if we can say well if we do this slightly differently if you're willing to compromise on this one thing be it camera angle or mm -hmm. you know something like that then suddenly we can do it you know and, and knowing that that collaboration is there that that people are willing to compromise just makes it so much easier to do that yeah, and then I have to say, sometimes that compromise comes up with better ideas and we end up in a better place <laughs> than we would have, which I, that I love. That's my favorite bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hear that quite often. And it's so good when everyone's on the same page that you can just kind of speak freely. You all are trying to make the best thing you can. Um, and it actually reminds me, guys, if you can recall back to post-production, I suppose, season one, was there a particular sequence or shot that was just really ridiculous to get done and get over the line properly? Like, was... What was keeping you up at night for season one? <laughs> Is that a silly question? Everything. <laughs> Everything. <Yeah. laughs> um, I mean, I think I think certainly the, the meteor shower scene was oh. was the one that that was just the most challenging in the in the sense that um the 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 guidance from Tony was really it was it was beautiful, it was specific, but it was also much more about this is, this is what I wanted to feel like rather than being specific about this is what I wanted to look like, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, so that was like a long, long process of um, both finding different references, different ideas, bouncing them off Tony, and then just doing development on it. And all the while sort of going, I hope this is it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like obviously showing it, like showing it along the way, but there's still sort of this feeling like, Will it actually all come together when you cut all of these shots together? And um, and it did. And I'm I'm really happy. And the the um, team at Scanline did a did an amazing job with that. You know. So um, and and their supervisor Yelmer as well. So, um, yeah. but yeah, that that was probably the the one that for the longest time I was like, I hope this works out. Yeah, you know why as well. Um, just to intercede, TJ, is because. The eye, like that had to be so spectacular because there's a whole culture on Altani who are who kind of worship it. And if you guys don't, if you drop the ball, we're taken out of it. And unfortunately, I was so glad. If you've got a really good quality TV, I recommend anyone watching this interview, go and watch that sequence. It's incredible. Anyway, TJ, what about you? Was it was would you agree that the the, the media shower was just really difficult to get get done? Yeah, because 
you know, as, as Mullen says, there was a lot to it. There was a lot that went into it. There was a lot of the feeling as opposed to the visual direction. But it was it was something we knew from the very beginning when we first read it in the first draft of the of the script. It was it was obvious to us, to to Tony, to Kathleen Kennedy, to everybody. This was going to be the piece that we're we're going to work on to the bitter end. <laughs> and and it was, but it was in a good way because we started right away. We we began with with look dev, um, with the third floor, with art department, with scan line. We worked our way through it so that we could you know find out what worked, what didn't work, and then and then by the time we were able to shoot it, we had a sense of where it was going, but we didn't have a full you know complete picture of it yet at that point. So there were some some leaps of faith that, that took place while we shot the sequence. And it wasn't until we were in editorial and John Gilroy got his hands on it and started yeah. shifting some of the scenes where we were able to put it to, to, together. All the while sound was beginning their sound design. So we had to collaborate with them to ensure that the meteor pings and hits were working with our effects and vice versa. And uh, it, was a, it was a hugely collaborative experience, which I, is, is always is my favorite to, to get as many people involved in it as possible. Uh, but by the time we got to the very end and we were color correcting it with JC in the eye, it was, this is going to be great. I really was, I was so proud and happy of it. And it took the entire length of the series to, to get it done. Wow. That's so interesting to me. Um, final question, and I'll let you go, is, well, I wanted to say, just tell me everything about season two, because I can't wait any longer. I'm very impatient, but I won't say that. What I will say is, from what you've seen so far, given you're in post now, what do you think? I mean, I know you're going to say it's amazing, but honestly, like you, you guys must be super excited to be working on season two and getting that out to the public. I, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm very excited yeah. by it. Um, uh, it's it's different. And I mean, we, we, there's been the, the news reports already that we're going to be you know, doing some time jumps and there's a different different viewing way of watching the season. And so it mixes it up a little bit. It's not the same. We're not revisiting the exact same way that we did season one, and yet we're still carrying the same tone through it. And uh, I, you know, I'm I'm really digging it. I think uh, I, I'm I'm really excited to, to keep moving forward on it. Yeah, uh, same, same here. And and obviously, always when you know when there's a season two of something that people like, then the ambition goes up. And so we're like, there's more ambition, and we're you know. We're going to do our best to um, to try and meet that. Yeah. Wow, I can't wait. Um, and but in the meantime, we can celebrate your nomination. Your show is also nominated for best drama series. That is incredible. Um, you guys should be all so proud. Um, and I look forward to speaking to you in a year's time or whatever for season two. But in the meantime, congrats and good luck at the Emmys. Thank you. Love it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.